welcome to Crimes Through Time, a weekly snapshot of crime history. On the evening of the 24th of 1890, Mr S Macdonald was making his way home along Crossfield Road, Hampstead, London, when he saw a young woman lying on the ground. He walked on, assuming she was drunk, but he became concerned that maybe she was ill and needed some help. Unfortunately, the lady was beyond help. She was dead and it was obvious that she had been subjected to a savage attack. He went to Swiss Cottage Police Station to raise the alarm. Rumours that this was the work of Jack the Ripper started immediately and as the local police notified Scotland Yard and that the detectives who had investigated the 1888 Whitechapel murder spree were quickly present at the crime scene proved the police also feared Jack had returned. Dr Wells examined the lady at the scene. She had suffered blunt force trauma to the head and her throat had been cut so deeply it had almost severed her head. A brown man's cardigan was loosely wrapped around her head. She had been dead for about an hour and given the lack of blood present and the awful wounds she had sustained it was clear that she had been murdered not where she had been found. Also, despite a thorough search of the surrounding area no murder weapon was found. But what the police did find was a broken screw and bolt, which would become very important later in the investigation. She was removed to Hampstead Hill Police Station for a detailed post-mortem and to begin the job of identifying the victim. A full description of the victim was circulated in the newspapers across the United Kingdom on Saturday the 25th of October. Her description was noted by the police as, quote, She is not more than 32 years old, 5 feet 5 inches, dark complexion, with dark hair and blue eyes. She had a jacket. Her dress was black cashmere. She wore two petticoats, one with red and yellow stripes and the other white flannel. Her white cotton chemise bore the letters PH neatly embroidered in red. She had woollen stockings in blue and a blue woollen vest. The style of this garment suggests that she was nursing a child. The police were right. The victim was indeed nursing a baby. And during the night of Friday to Saturday, a bloodstained and broken baby's perambulator was found about a mile away from the victim. The screw and bolt found matched the pram. Also, there was hair similar to the dead woman present inside. It would take another day for the baby to be located. In Kentish Town, London, a family were becoming concerned. 32-year-old Phoebe Hogg and her 18-month-old baby, also Phoebe, hadn't returned home after leaving the house around 3pm Friday afternoon. She lived with her husband Frank Hogg on one floor and her mother and sister Clara lived upstairs. Her father lived in Rickmansworth and had been of ill health. So they hoped she had gone to visit him, but on Saturday morning came and still no word, they began to search. Frank headed to check with her father and Clara headed to Priory Street to visit a family friend, Mary Piercy. Mary at first denied seeing Phoebe and then when pressed by Clara she admitted that Phoebe had called around 5pm and asked her to watch the baby, but Mary was unable to. Phoebe had sworn her to secrecy about the visit. Clara thought this very odd and she also noticed bruises, cuts and scratches on Mary's hands. Mary explained that she had been killing mice. Clara and Mary returned to the Hogs' home and was met by their landlady, Mrs Burrard, who had seen the newspaper reports of the murder and was concerned that the description so closely resembled Phoebe. Clara agreed and suggested they head to the police station, but Mary tried everything to deter her. Clara insisted and a reluctant Mary accompanied her. Inspector Thomas Bannister was in charge of the investigation. He escorted them to the mortuary. Mary very quickly and emphatically exclaims, That's not her! Clara, though, was able to identify Phoebe's clothes, but the injuries made it hard to be sure when she viewed the body. Mary started to pull Clara away, much to her frustration. The doctor was able to wash Phoebe's face and this allowed Clara to fully see and she was able to identify her conclusively. 
Clara was also able to positively identify the pram, but was shocked at the condition of it. It had undergone very rough usage since she had seen Phoebe leave pushing it on Friday afternoon. The women and two detectives returned to the Hogg residence. Frank had returned and was given the news of his wife's murder. Inspector Bannister had become very suspicious of Mary Percy at this point. Her behaviour was very odd. He decided to search her house. Mary insisted she hadn't seen Phoebe, but let them in to search the property. What they found made them believe that they had found the scene of the murder. There was broken furniture and a window, blood spatter on the walls and ceiling, and blood on the floor and a rug. In a table drawer, a carving knife with blood on the handle, and in the fender, a poker. Also, there was bloodied clothes, a black skirt and a recently washed apron. Curiously, Mary chose to whistle the whole time the police searched was going on and showed no emotion when items were discovered and removed. Her only explanation was that she had been killing mice, but she did concede she had seen Phoebe on Friday, telling the same story she told Clara, but she claimed Clara told her not to tell the police. She was arrested for the murder of Phoebe Hogg and her baby. She was taken to Kentish Town Police Station. Here she was asked to remove her gloves and the inspector observed the scratches and abrasions that Clara had noticed earlier that day. Mary denied the murder. Quote, well, I would not do such a dreadful thing. I would not hurt anybody. End quote. Around 6.30am on Sunday the 26th of October, Baby Phoebe Hogg was discovered on Wasteland in Finchley Road by a hawker called Oliver Smith. There were no signs of violence and Phoebe was fully dressed, except for a sock and a shoe. She appeared to have passed away from exposure or suffocation. She was taken to Hampstead Mortuary and reunited with her mother. On Monday the 27th of October 1890, Mary Piercy was charged with the willful and felonious killing of Phoebe Hogg and baby Phoebe Hanslope Hogg. Mary's trial started at the Old Bailey, London, on the 1st of December 1890 and lasted three days. The prosecution's case was conducted by Mr Forrest Fulton and Mr C.F. Gill. Their theory of the crime was that Mary had lured Phoebe over to her home by sending her a note. The delivery boy testified to the content of the note. Phoebe was witnessed arriving at Mary's around 3pm. During the course of tea, Phoebe said something that made Mary fly into a violent rage, hitting her on the head with a poker and then cut her throat. But damage at the scene and wounds on Mary's hands showed that Phoebe fought for her life and that of her daughter. This occurred around 4pm. Mary's neighbour testified to shouting over the fence after hearing screams coming from the house. Mary then loaded Phoebe into the pram, placing the body on top of the baby, causing her to suffocate. She then walked the pram through the street towards the wasteland, where she passed several witnesses. However, the pram broke and Phoebe fell out and landed in the spot where she would later be discovered. Mary then went on to dump the pram and continued to the wasteland, where she left baby Phoebe to be found. The testimony of Frank Hogg and John Charles Piercy were of particular note. The police had discovered that Frank Hogg and Mary Piercy were having an affair. He was pressed on the stand and admitted, quote, I visited Mrs. Piercy two or three times a week and must admit I was on intimate terms with her, but I did not think my wife knew anything about it, end quote. Letters from Mary to Frank were read that detailed just how in love with him she was. Weirdly, though, she had encouraged him to marry Phoebe when she became pregnant because it was the right thing to do. Mary was fully aware of the love triangle, but had never spoken badly of Phoebe. It was still unknown what would have been said to Mary to set off such a savage reaction. John Piercy had known Mary when she was 18 year years old. She was 24 at the time of her arrest. They had lived together but never married, revealing her real name to be Mary Eleanor Wheeler. They had been separated for two years. He was able to identify the cardigan found wrapped around Phoebe's head as one that he had left with Mary when they ended their relationship, 
because of its worn condition. Mr Arthur Hutton defended Mary. He called no witnesses on Mary's behalf but warned that all the evidence was circumstantial and shouldn't be taken as conclusive. Mary was found guilty after 52 minutes of deliberation. Asked if she knew of any reason that the court should not deliver the sentence of death in accordance with the law, she answered, quote, I say I am innocent of this charge, end quote. Mr Justice Denman donned the black cap and sentenced her to be hanged. Prior to 1907, there was no court of appeal, but a legal team tried hard to convince the Home Office that Mary was in fact insane and therefore in not control of her actions. Mary didn't cooperate with this line of defence and was adamant that she was not insane in any way. Her case was marked, quote, the law must take its course, end quote. On her final night, she visited Mr Frank Palmer, her solicitor. She requested a personal advert be placed for her in the Madrid newspaper. It read, M-E-C-P, last wish of M-E-W, have not betrayed. It can be assumed M-E-W is Mary Eleanor Wheeler, but she refused to ex explain what this message meant. She went to the gallows on the 23rd of December 1890 at Newgate Prison and was hanged by James Berry. She protested her innocence to the end. This case garnered major newspaper coverage and public interest. Madame Tussauds made a, a wax figure of Mary for their Chamber of Horrors exhibit. They also purchased the pram and the contents of the kitchen murder scene. The noose used to hang Mary is still on display at the Black Museum of Scotland Yard. Mary had no history of violence or criminal record. The fact that her first kill was so savage and ripper-like put her in the mix as a potential ripper suspect. The idea that Jack was actually Jill the Ripper was nothing new. Inspector Abilene had considered this during the original investigation, mainly in relation to the final murder of the canonical five Jack victims, Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly's time of death was 3.30am to 4am, but there was a witness that saw her alive twice after that. Could it be that the killer, making their getaway, dressed in her clothes? The, the, the theory was really explored for the first time by William Stewart in his 1939 book, Jack the Ripper, A New Theory. He proposed the mad midwife theory that the Ripper was a midwife and abortionist that had been betrayed by a patient and had been sent to prison. After release, they got their revenge on women. A midwife or abortionist would have had the anatomical knowledge, could be out at night without question, could have bloody clothes on and be found near a body and have a reasonable explanation. William's number one suspect was Mary Piercy citing the savage throat cutting and the fact that the murders were committed in private and dumped in secluded streets. The Ripper kills were 1888, Mary killed in 1890. He tackles the question of whether a woman would have had the physical strength to overpower his victims and he quoted Sir Melville McConaughey's description of Mary, quote, I have never seen a woman of stronger physique and nerves were as cast iron as her body, end quote. But there were some holes in the theory. Mary had never been a midwife, had never been to prison, and she was hanged at just 24 years old, meaning she was 21 when the Ripper kills happened. The female Ripper theory is considered the weakest. However, in 2006, the DNA was tested on the stamps from the letters sent to the police from Jack in 1888. These letters are widely believed and accepted to be real, and the DNA was found to be female. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of this case in the comments. And I look forward to welcoming you in the next one.